Looks good. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Great. Well, thank you. So, everybody, welcome to my presentation. My name is James Sarah. I work for Microsoft, and I'm a big data evangelist. The title of this is long, so I thought, well, I, can just, I need to shorten this up in the future. So I think a more appropriate would be building a big data solution. This kind of plays off of a previous presentation I, give, uh, I gave called Building an Effective Data Warehouse Architecture. Now I'm adding in some new technologies out there, and, and hence this presentation that came out of, of these new ways of building a data warehouse or incorporating other technologies into it. I like this slide. We're talking to a lot of people now about building big data solutions. A lot of them have tried it, and some of them have failed. They've, they've ended up passed out drunk in a Denny's parking lot after trying some big data in there. So what I'm trying to do is prevent that from happening in there. Let's talk about some technologies that you can use to prevent, to prevent you from being a, one of the, those statistics of, hey, we tried big data, and we just the project bombed in here. So with that, I'll review quickly what we talked about in my previous presentation that I said we kind of, this kind of leads up to. We'll talk about what, exactly what is big data and analytics. <clears throat> we'll go over some use cases. We'll talk about a data lake, which is a popular term right now. We'll dive into Hadoop how, and how it fits in the data warehouse world. We'll talk about IoT, Internet of Things. What, what is that and how does that incorporate, is, should be incorporated into a data warehouse? The modern data warehouse will be something we'll spend a bit of time on to talk about how all these technologies fit together. And then we'll talk about federated querying, what that is, and then using the cloud for data warehouse, and then SMP versus MPP, so that's where I'll we'll answer what the difference between those two technologies are. So let's get into a bit about what I talked about in my previous presentation. What is a data warehouse and why use one? So in general, a data warehouse is a central repository where we're going to have all these various subject areas combined to be a single version of the truth in there. It's not an OLTP solution. This is for heavy reads and little writes. It's going to be where we're going to analyze our data, where we're going to generate a lot of those analytical reports. Not so much real-time reporting, but end of day that we want to go back and look at a historical reporting. Some of the reasons for a data warehouse are listed here. I won't go over all these, but the, the big ones I always point out are it's optimized for read access. You integrate many sources of data in there, and you're able to keep the history of any data you want in this sensor repository in there. Because I like pretty pictures, this is what I like to show on the difference between what you have on the left where you don't have a data warehouse and instead you have all this various ETL and queries going all over the place to combine this data from all these various subject areas in there. Instead, if we create a, this enterprise data warehouse, we put all this data in one central location, reporting obviously becomes much easier. The end users just know they have to go to one spot to get all the answers. You can clean up the data more easily. You can control it. And basically, any question they want to ask, they should be able to do this right against this enterprise data warehouse in there. So you save time building reports, but also it allows you to slice and dice reports that you, in ways that you never have been able to do before because this data is organized in a way that it's fast and is all linked together. You can then generate business insights out of this data and, and in the end make better business decisions that you couldn't do before. This is what a typical hybrid model, I go more into presentation on Kindle, Inman and the difference between the two, but in the end this is what we see most common in solutions out there is a combination of two where they, they have their data sources, they usually mirror them and, and you do that to prevent a lot of a performance hit on your source system when you're creating this data warehouse, so you just have a copy of it, then you put it into staging. Again, reduce the stress, and also to do a, a, the concept of, of let's load the data in there as quickly and then transform it. So we, we'll get a little bit into that later. But then you take the data and you can move it into what Emin calls a, a corporate information factory. This is where you keep the data as it is and as low as grain, it's normalized. You may do a, a bit of cleanup and a bit of uh, denormalizing as you move it over into this corporate information factory. But from there, that's the, that's the first step. The next step is then generating your, your data marts or your star schemas, putting it in that, that format that makes it much easier for end users to generate reports from, as well as makes it much easier to build cubes out of. And in this step, I want to point out this, not every data source fit will fit into this model. There could be shortcuts. 
I may not need to create a cube, or I may not need to create a start schema, or if it's a small enough table in the source system, hey, I can just move it right along into the cube without really going along these steps. So I always stress that not every data source needs to have these various copies of the data as, long, as it goes along the way in there. And the other important thing is that this solution does not mean I have to have separate servers for each step along the way. For example, my staging, my corporate information factory, my star schemas, they could all be in the same powerful server, particularly if you were to use an MVP technology, which I'll talk about. Or I could have my a one data warehouse that has schemas, and those data marts are all schemas in there. So you just want to pick out a, a, a solution that is easier to maintain going forward, reduce the number of copies. And, and so again, and every, every source system will, will make a difference in the way you approach it. And, and this is th the way uh, I ended the, the last presentation with this is what your architecture may look like. Taking on that previous slide and adding in some of the, the reporting tools that you'll, you, you may want to use in there. But this solution becomes changed when you start talking about big data in here. And I also want to point out, in my presentation, I'm not talking about products. I'm just talking about general overview of what big data is. And a follow-up presentation will, will be how Microsoft solves big data. But in this presentation, I want to keep the vendors and the tools out of it and just talk about the technologies and the approaches in there. So how does big data change this? Well, first, we've got to define what big data is. It's data. Think of big data as the current as currency. I, I thought that's a, a great way to, to think of it as the more data you have, the more currency you have, the richer you are in there. The bottom line is the companies that take advantage of these data opportunities are going to outperform those companies that do not take advantage of them. And so you have to think of the more data you have, you can use it to make better business decisions. And if you're not doing it, your competi com competition may be doing it, so you're putting yourself at a big disadvantage in there. So what are these, th these companies doing with this data? Well, first of all, you think of big data as all forms and all sizes, meaning I don't really care what the structure is in there. I'm going to incorporate all of that in there. And I like to think of big data term is not necessarily the amount of data, but the type of data. I like to replace big data term with the, with the term all data, because that's in the end what you want to capture. And it doesn't really matter the size of it. It's generally going to be a lot more when you talk about all data, but it doesn't really matter what the size is in there. And Again, you want to just capture this and use it for new insights to get to make better and faster decisions in there. You want to you want to grab unstructured and structured data. Now, the structured data is what we were most useful. Useful. We have our CRM and ERP systems. They're all uh, third-party products that create this data, and it's in a, a nice format relationally that makes it a lot easier to use. Unstructured data, which I like to use the term better as non-relational, but the, that incorporates your social media data, your, your Hadoop type solutions, your Twitter data, your Internet of Things device data. That's what we talk about uh, unstructured in, in there, or semi-structured. And then the streaming data means I want to have data more frequently than maybe the end of the day. Maybe I want to capture device information and pull it in, or Twitter data, and I want to do that in real time. So the challenge is with this big data approach, or all data, is capturing all this information and your traditional data warehouse many times collapses because it just can't handle all this. And it's, I, I like the last line in here is, in the end, you want to get the right information to the right people at the right time in the right format. I, I, I've heard a lot of clients when I present them talk about that, and I think that's a great way to kind of sum it all up. And here's what we're looking at in our world today. There's so much data. We're bombarded with it. Not just what we have on-prem in, in our in our company, but data that we're getting from the internet and the social media and cloud and mobile now. It's just tons of this data in here. And these numbers are really staggering here. And you've probably heard that we're doubling the amount of data we capture every two years in there. Well, how can we use this? What good is it if, if we seal this information but don't act on it? And you may hear about the three Vs. This is a common terminology people use, velocity, volume, and variety in there. Our volumes are growing. Our velocity, meaning how often we get the data, is growing. And then the variety, the type of data we're getting, is growing in there. And so your circle in here, this, this red circle, as it expands, it gets more and more difficult to have a solution that encapsulates all this. And this is where the big data solutions that we'll talk about the technologies come into play. 
And this is what you want to get to. Uh, many companies are unfortunately still on that bottom left in there where they're, they're not innovating, they're not getting a lot of value of their data. They have all those spread marks, various Excel spreadsheets everywhere, maybe data marks spread all over the place. Let's take it to the next level and get the enterprise data warehouse in there. We, we, it's a lot of detail that's involved in that. It's, it's all analytical processing, building cubes and things like that. And what that gives you is the ability to then innovate more by having dashboards where you can slice and dice. You can incorporate the Hadoop data, that semi-structured data in there. You can have end users do ad hoc queries and such in there. And still have your operational reporting, but have it much more timely. And then finally, getting all the way to the right, we get the most innovations. We start diving into machine learning and, and Internet of Things, which we'll talk about. But now we're getting into the area where we can really make use of this data, not only in seeing where we've been, but predicting where we're going in the future. And here's what we want to do. I want to, you want to be able to answer new questions. I want to take all this data, data that's personal or agency and community and world data and weather data and whatever you can think of and just get a lot of value out of this, answer new questions that we've never been able to ask, ask before in there. If I'm a company and I, there's a lot of things I've never even thought about trying to capture, and I want to find out what people think about our brand in there. Well, I can go to Twitter data and I can get that. And then that's going to allow me to ask more and more questions by pulling in more data. So think of big data as just this, this amazing place where you can grab all this data and just come out in the end with something that's going to help your business in ways that you never thought of before. And, and think of how you can spread this big data approach throughout your whole organization. You want to be able to inspire people. You want to have those end users get excited about what they're doing. You want to show them reporting that they can do that they've never thought of before. Not only can you save them time in generating reports, but they can ask questions and they can get answers they've never thought possible. And the decision making will become quicker and they can learn and share insights with other people. And you start seeing this amazing light bulbs go off and everybody starts thinking of better ways of using this data and better questions and answers to get out of it. And you see your whole company thrive on all this new information that they're given. And think of it as all areas of my business can, can be improved by having big data. I can, I can use it in marketing for better customer relationships. I can use the finance to, get, to help my bottom line. I can improve my sales. I can, in HR, I can improve the way we work with employees in there. If you're familiar with the balanced scorecard approach, this is where we get into looking at all facets of your organization and using data for one area to help the other area out there. So this is what big data can get you. But here's the problem, there's a big data divide in there, meaning we're generating these tons of this data. A lot of it's generated from customers in here, but if we're, if we're generating many, that 80% of data is, that out there is getting stored, but we're only using 3% or less than 1%, there's a big problem here. There's, we're capturing all this, but we're not using it. Now, I like to always preference by saying, sometimes we're capturing data that's not gonna be useful. Sometimes we may be pulling in data that like uh, one client I saw, they're pulling in data from a device and every minute they're getting a status of whether this particular part is doing okay. So it's just repeating okay, okay, okay every few minutes in there. Well, that, that's a lot of that data we don't need in there, but out of that 80%, you can bet there's still gonna be tons of data that we can use, but it's just sitting there landing in some area and we're never analyzing it there. So that's this big big problem that we have and it's a challenge of, capture, of not only capturing all that data, but then putting it to good use. And that's where we're talking about solutions for that. I, I like this slide because it uh, shows that a lot of companies are failing. Gartner says 60% of big data projects will fail or get, will not go beyond piloting by the year 2017. That's a huge number. And that's, that's equivalent to what I see with failures with uh, data warehouse projects in general. Before I came to Microsoft, I did a lot of data warehouse projects and BI projects in there. And I, it was amazing how many of these would, would just collapse after, after sometimes years in the making in there. And I think a lot of it goes to a, a number of reasons, and I have other presentations on this, but a lot of it is not using the right technologies and tools. People only, only know what they know, and so they create a solution with a limited knowledge of what they could be doing with it. And they architect a bad solution, and then in the end, they come up with a disaster in there. And there's also a lot of, Hadoop, Hadoop's got a lot of hype about it, and there's a lot of great things about it. But it has some limitations, and it, and it has to, you have to better understand the proper use cases for Hadoop, and we'll go over some of that. 
and in the end, this is what we want. We want to just capture a lot of data. We want to integrate it. We want to clean it. And then we want to derive insight from that data. We want to use those various reporting tools in there to slice and dice it. And then, and then we want to take action on our data. It's not enough just to get these nice reports, but can they be developed in a way that I can then improve my business by taking action, by understanding the business better in there. So in the, in the end, the data and reports are great, but we want to be able to take action from there. And advanced analytics is a terminology also called business analytics that this Gartner, I thought, does a great job of showing the steps along the way. We can start out with capturing the data to find out what happened with our business. And this is where most companies are at. They built a data warehouse or, or building one. And they can use that to see what happened. And then diagnostically, they can see why did it happen. They can look at trends and patterns over it. Um, we could do things like Netflix is using. They can look at historical data of customers, and then they can use it to improve the recommendation engine that you, you see them come out with it. So that's a great way of, of taking what you've known and then applying diagnostic analytics to it in there. But now let's go to the next step. We're seeing companies dip their toes into predictive analysts and try to pick out, try to determine what will happen in there. Forecasts, model and forecast what might happen in the future. For example, maybe I want to look at my customer data and I want to figure out which customers are going to leave or stay or buy or not buy in there. And I can tailor my approaches to that customer based on that information. I'm not going to want to send maybe coupons or sale information to people who I don't think are going to buy in there. But if I can, I can predict better who's going to buy, then they're going to be the most ones responsive to those sales pitches I'll give to them. And then the final layer where you're really getting the most business app impact, but also requires a lot more skills, is pres prescriptive analytics, where I'm trying to find the best solution or preferred course of, cost, course of action among a, a bunch of different choices in there. That a lot of times with this particular solution is you'll want to run models to predict things on there. For example, we see in healthcare where they're going to figure out their the proper clinical actions to take by making treatment recommendations that are based on models that are using historical information and outcome data. And from that, they can determine the best care to give the patient by running through these models in there. So you're getting really advanced results from this. And that is the ultimate solution for every company in there. But that's a long process to get to that. I mean, honestly, most companies are having a hard enough time capturing what happened here. But I think it's good to understand where you want to go in this to see your capabilities. And in the end, when you start presenting what you can do with this data, then you get re people really excited. They see the value in it. And they're more acceptable to have this long-term project because they see the benefit at the end of the ro road. And you're, fo you're taking them off the focus of short-term results and trying to make them focus on the long-term solutions and the long-term benefit that you can get out of, of building a data warehouse. And this is what we want in the end, a, a beautiful looking dashboard that has at our fingertips all about our business that we can see and then we can dive in and we can slice and dice and we can use all of our information to make, again, better business decisions in here. The reporting is usually the easiest part. It's building the data warehouse out there. I would say if you look at a data warehouse solution, 80% of your time is going to be writing an ETL, cleaning up the data, mastering it, and putting it in the data warehouse. And then from there, generating reports is is generally the easy and the short-term part in there. But it's always good, especially when you're presenting to your internal groups, your end users, to show them what they can get and show them the reporting. And, and a lot of times, you're, you're showing them things they never knew that was even possible in there. And again, you get their buy-in in there and get them excited about that and more willing to contribute with your project. So use cases. I bring these up just to set a light bulb off in your head of what can we do with big data? Because as I start talk, talking about using things like social media in there, a lot of companies, who, a lot of people have never even thought about using, what am I going to use Twitter data for? It suddenly becomes very apparent that they can, they can use this Twitter data. And, and for their particular business, I, I will actually see light bulbs sometimes in their eyes when they think of all the things they can do with it. So I'm just going to go over a couple of ones I thought were, were pretty cool. Um, out of all these ones, I'll pick out a few of them. But you can see there's just an unlimited amount of 
things you can do with big data, anywhere from fraud detection to traffic flow optimization to um, sentiment analysis with social media data in there to, to monitoring my smart meters. That It's a big thing now. And they're installing, where I used to live, all these meters that capture at an instance everything about your power consumption. And then they're, they're, they're giving you or selling you apps that you can use to, to and in the end, send, save money because you can look at what power I'm using, when I can lower my thermostat, when I can turn off the lights, all these kind of things, and there's just tons and tons of it. So one of them I thought was, was pretty cool was insurance in there. And w insurance companies can collect all this information, even use it through sensors in your car to, 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 to show what kind of driver you are. So instead of what they do now is they, they put you in this bucket. OK, you're, you're, you're male, you're between this age, and we'll look at your driving record, and we'll look at the driving records of others and, and determine the average number of accidents people get into, and, and that's where we're going to come up with your, your quote or how much you're going to pay for your premium in there. Well, instead, some, we're starting to see insurance companies now take actual information that you, from your car and use that to determine what kind of risk you are based on what you, your driving patterns, your driving history in there. And they can then present per, um, policies that can reduce costs and better help help better meet the customer needs and give you something that you actually need as opposed to this blanket insurance that they most come and give you. And in the end, they're going to save money and you're going to save money on there. But again, this is capturing big data and the difficulty is how are we going to incorporate all this sensor data into our data warehouse in there? A recommendation, and you've probably all seen this, you go and buy something on Amazon, they, they recommend, recommend what else you may want to buy, which to me is I'm always doing that. They always seem to present something really interesting for me, and I don't know how they do it. Once you start digging into the details and you see how they're capturing this information about you and the information about other customers who bought similar products, and they put it into this recommendation engine in there. Netflix is the same thing. Any, every company could be using this. Recommend when you go online to any online store, I want to, when you go to checkout, recommend a few other things. And even if just a few people bite on that, that's, that's going to be more sales than you would have had before. Caption with big data allows you to do things like this. And then the other one is the pricing analysis I thought was another cool one where I can look at, if I'm a real retailer, the margins of what I sell in there and then combine that with what margins are from competitors and things like that to determine the best price to, to offer you. I, I don't are notorious for this. Depending what time of the day or what day of the month, they have all this down to a science. They know just what people will buy based on all these factors in there. And they're, they're pulling in unlimited amounts of big data to determine the best price and the best margin to get out of that. Why can't other retail companies do that? Any business that's selling any sort of product or service should be able to do the same thing. It's just about capturing all that data. And this was a cool one, I thought, too of a London Underground, where they wanted to, in the end, determine the best train schedules to create. And they pulled in all those various data to get, to get that. They, they pulled in sentiment data where they would mine Twitter and they'd find out what people were saying or who was complaining trains were overcrowded or undercrowded or too late or too early in that. They, they looked up bike sensors of all things where they found out people who were getting off the train and then using bikes to go to their place of work. Maybe we can use that information to create better routes where we can end at different locations instead. They looked at GPS to find out what the traffic was like for buses uh, or for traffic patterns outside. And that, again, could affect the way or the schedules that they would want to produce from the, the various trains in there. And then finally, the customer movements. They can actually use Wi-Fi with people's permissions to find out what their walking patterns and how long they were waiting at the stations in there. Amazing what you can do with all this data and how it can make your business much more efficient and make your company comp customers more happy in there. But it's a big challenge gathering all this data and pulling it together and generating the results on there. That's what is, is the difficulty in there. But, but it, hopefully this presents a, a overview of all the possibilities and, and you've got a few light bulbs going off in your head and what you can do in your own business. Data Lake. This is a, a very popular term we're seeing now. And I, I want to sort of clarify what we mean by data lake in here. Because um, you'll see people call it Bitbucket or Landing Zone. Uh, Cloudera has their own term called Enterprise Data Hub. 
But in the end, this is just a storage repository to dump all this data in its raw format. It's, it's, you may have heard schema on read and schema on write. What, I, what they mean by that is in a traditional data warehouse, you have to create a schema and when, when data is going to be written to the database in here. So there's some upfront work that needs to be done for that. Where with a data lake, it's schema on read. I mean, I'm just going to dump this data in here. And, and it's not until I'm going to pull it out that I'm actually going to create a schema for it and define it all in there. So the big benefit of that is I'm saving a lot of upfront work in there. And there could be a lot of data that I'm never really going to need. So if I have to create schemas upfront for all this, it could be wasting a lot of time. So data lake is great for that. It's also um, generally a Hadoop solution, which, which is much more inexpensive than your data warehouse solution. And it allows you to collect data just in case, meaning I, I don't know if I really need this but I don't want to delete it. Well, if I create this data lake and it's low cost to do this, I can have this as a dumping ground for all that data. And here's what we see. The traditional approaches in here that you may be familiar with is, so we have our data sources. We use ETL. We put it in a data warehouse in there. It's, it's rigid. It's, it's, it's manicured in there. It requires a lot of monitoring in there. And then we generate our reports off of that, our, our BI solutions in there. And we uh, um, are able to then um, have our reports. But generally, we have a bit of a delay in there because of this, this solution here is, at best, we, we look data at the previous day, which, which could be OK. But more and more companies now are, let's, let's do this more in more real time. I don't want to wait to the end of the day. I, I, maybe it's closing, and I want more updates. Or maybe I want um, to be able to respond to customers throughout the day with this historical data. Uh, so I need to have a faster solution in there. So if we look at the, the problems that when we incorporate big data into this environment in here, we have more data volumes in there. And there could be some non-relational uh, semi-structured data in there. What, what does that ha how does it affect things? Well, the ETL then becomes much slower in there because we're incorporating all this, this additional data in there. A lot of times you see companies like, well, we don't have the time to monitor the data. We don't have the time to clean it up as much as we, we would like to. There's just so much of this data going in there, it's just, it's just almost impossible to keep up with it. And then the reporting becomes stale, because now we start dropping off and, and ignoring other reports, because we don't have the time to incorporate them anymore. Um, the reports become not as valuable, because we haven't cleaned the data as well in there, which could be a killer in there. And it also prevents us from really being innovative, because we just spend more and more time just trying to to keep up with all this increased data volumes in there. So if we decide, well, we're not going to do anything to this, we, this in, insightful data is lost. We can't use all that, that Twitter data and things that we can find the value out of there. Uh, think, the times to get reports slow down, we start seeing duplicate data because we're doing all these various data marts throughout there. So it becomes a big problem in there. So this is where a data log lake can help solve that problem there, where, hey, let's take all this data structured, non-structured, non-relational data, everything and anything, we want to put the ETL into a data lake in there. ETL could be simple as copying the data, this files into this data lake in there. Many times it is in there. But for that stru structured data, we may want to use certain type of ETL to put into a data lake in there. And again, it's stored in this regular format. There's no need to convert it. Uh, it isn't until you start getting to when you just pull it out where you, def you find the data that's most valuable is where you'll start doing this, this schema on read, where you, you, you'll, you'll take that data and you'll clarify it all. And also, at this point, is where you can clean up the data and refine it all in there. And that, that's a big part, especially with Twitter data. There may be, I can go and for free, I can get the last week of Twitter data, and I can pull out. I can put a few keywords, but I may get 10 terabytes of data. But as I filter it all, most of that's going to be cleaning up all the, the curse words that you see in there. Um, I may get down to just one gigabyte in there. So I can, in this data lake area, I can do all that refining. And that's where Hadoop really shines. They have a lot of tools for cleaning and filtering data in there and get it to a reasonable amount of data that I can then use in, in my data warehouse solution in there. And then have all the various BI reporting on top of that. So what helps is this: we get the entire universe is captured in there. We want to put it on a Hadoop that can give us a lot of horsepower. The great thing about Hadoop is not only 
it replicates the data so you don't have to worry about if, if a drive or something fails in there because it's got it's all replicated but also it spreads any large files out into pieces among various clusters so it, the performance can be very fast for that refinement that you need in there and th there's some other things you can read in here but in the end you have one area that all your your data is stored whether you can use it or not you can be really confident knowing I've captured everything in there and now let's dig through and find out the benefits of it. So let's look at Hadoop and its role in this area in here because when I give these presentations and I talk everybody is familiar with Hadoop. Very few people are using it in production. Uh, a lot of it comes down to the skill set required to, to build Hadoop solo solutions in there. A lot of the solutions are not really related to data warehouse. People are often going doing their own thing and it may be later to decide that we need to, this would be beneficial to put in our Hadoop or in our data warehouse. <clears throat> but I like to point out that Hadoop is great for processing large amounts of data, but it's not really designed and, and never was designed to analyze that data in real time. So, meaning I, I just can't dump data in Hadoop and then quickly run a report off that and a query off that, it's going to come back in milliseconds in there. Most of the companies we're seeing when they use Hadoop, they're using the batch oriented Format. They're, they're running reports at night off the Hadoop, which can be great and can solve a lot of issues in there. The confusion comes in there when they try to incorporate Hadoop into, in, as make that as their enterprise data warehouse and, and replace it. Well, we want to, what I want to talk about is Hadoop should be used in conjunction with your relational database management system and not as a replacement over there. But the, the complexity is there's so many tools out there. I mean, here's just a handful of them listed on here. There's, there's literally hundreds of them, so it becomes very confusing and becomes very challenging to in incorporate Hadoop into our world in there. If you look at the Hortonworks data platform, which in the end, Hortonworks is, they're not creating anything, anything new. They're just gathering all this technology and putting it in a platform that you can download and use right, on, right away in there. Sure, you can off, go off on your own and you can download all these various technologies. I can download HDFS and HDP and HV base and Storm and I can install them all on my own, but then I have to figure out how they all integrate together. I have to actually administrate them. Where Hortonworks helps is they, they free collect all this, they make sure it all works together, and then they support it. And then you pay for, for, for the um, support that they can give you for, for any of these technologies. Because as great as open source is, and as free as people think it is, and for licensing, in the end, the cost can be a lot more for various other reasons in there. One being just the, the time and the effort to install everything and make it all work together in here. And this is where I really, I love this slide that um, I put together from this report that came out by uh, Winter Corporation where they talked about what does big data really cost in there because we see so many people who think Hadoop can be our, our great way to save money and it can when you talk about certain use cases, one being data refining example in here. This was a solution that they projected out over five years of how much it would cost to do a solution and refining solution in Hadoop. And you see that the RDBMS, the, the biggest problem is the upfront cost in there. And that's the big difference with Hadoop is very small. Uh, and then as you get along and you're refining it and you're writing queries and ETL and on that, we're refining Hadoop, the cost is going to continue to be very low in there. So that big uh, um, boost of payment that comes in with purchasing RDMS is, is never caught up in there. And so Hadoop can be up three times cheaper when looking at refining. And by refining, I mean getting data, massaging it, and filtering it, and cleaning it, and doing all that within a Hadoop ecosystem in there. However, the EDW, if I wanted to use Hadoop as my enterprise data warehouse and not use a relational database management system, meaning SQL Server, Oracle, and such, the costs over five years are going to be tremendous. So the upfront cost of purchasing is, is, a big, is obviously much smaller in Hadoop. But as you write out ETL to build this data warehouse, as you write queries and analyze it and do reporting off of that, the costs become so much more in Hadoop for some very obvious reasons, like just finding the skill set of people that can understand all the technologies and how they work and how they integrate and which ones to use. And they're changing every few weeks and new things come out. And we have Spark and Impala and Storm and all these things. How are we going to use it all together? And many of the companies I find, they're just, they're not radical enough to really jump on Hadoop for EDW. So the, the good thing is they're not taking on these large projects, which can be done, but you just have to have an environment where you're really on the bleeding edge in there and you really have the skill sets. And that's where the, 
you know, the Facebooks and the Yahoo's and, and and Twitters, they all are really all on Hadoop, but how many of us are like those companies out there? How many of us have that their type of data? Just a whole different environment. So you've got to be really careful when you, you hear about their solutions, you think these are great, but when I'm talking about my company and we're talking about operational and financial data, it's a whole different ballgame in there. And so I, I just really want you to, to, to understand an enterprise data warehouse built in Hadoop can, can be very cost prohibitive uh, over time. So with that being said, what is Hadoop good for when I'm building a data warehouse? And there's some really good use cases for using it in a combination with your RDBMS solution in there. The one being using Hadoop as an archiving solution. I want to be able to move data over from my relational engine that may be over five years old. I don't I really if ever the users are gonna are gonna query that. But I don't want to back up and, and on a USB drive and then have to restore it later if they do decide they want to use it. I can move it over into this cold storage and have it readily available. And I can have queries on top of that. So I can have the answers from that older data very quickly in there. So so it may not be as fast as having the data in your RD mess, but you're going to have that available and make it much easier. The other we're seeing a lot of is exporting data out to Hadoop, copying it. So I may have data sitting in my data warehouse, my relational data warehouse, and I have an end user who's that quote data scientist, and he says, man, I love some of your data warehouse data, and can you put it in this Hadoop cluster? Maybe it's on-prem, maybe it's in the cloud. I'm going to then copy that data over and give them and generate that file for him very quickly, and he can then go and play with that data in that Hadoop world. In there. So we're seeing a lot of that, and there are technologies, we'll talk about the federated query engine, that allow you to use regular SQL to pull that, push that data out over there instead of having to write your own Hadoop solution for that, there are, we're seeing more and more technologies that make it really easy to move it from one, that one platform to the other. And then probably the most <coughs> common one is using Hadoop as that staging area, as that play area. Again, this is the data lake that we're talking about. And that's where you refine the data, and that's the first step before you actually move it into your, your enterprise data warehouse, your relational. Uh, your RDMS in there. And that's, that's really probably the ideal solution for companies now, is to think of it in terms of Hadoop will be my data lake where I can land all the data, I can refine it, cleaning up, and then what results out of that will be moved into my data warehouse in there. And so that becomes the first step in the process. Internet of Things. This is a, a, probably the, the most widely used term that people don't know what it means. And in short, it's just connecting various devices that are generating data and taking that data from that and landing it in maybe that data lake and then move to a data warehouse where I can analyze it. So think of all the possibilities really are endless of, of the devices I can use, everything from the thermostat in my home to the car pad sensors in my car to road GPS systems in there to what's on mail trucks in there. It just goes on and on in there. So that's what Internet of Things is, just capturing all this various data. And, and you can just imagine where we're going with this. Anything and everything can, can, can be captured in there. If we can get around the privacy issues, we can open up a whole other world of, hey, I want to be driving down my car and I instantly want data coming back that tells me which roads to take because I'm getting all this feedback. I have alerts coming of, of parts that may need to be replaced before they actually break down. And when that I get that alert, it's automatically going to set up an appointment at my local car dealership because it knows where I'm at and knows how close they are. And they get a, a email alert to say, this customer is going to come in, go order this part. If you don't already have it, you know, automatically set the schedule. I mean, just think of all the conveniences to provide in there. Um, and, and it's just a matter of, not only having all these devices, but the, the, the difficulty in capturing all that, you can imagine, is, is a big, huge challenge that, that we're facing. And, and here's, an, here's some more things that um, I point out. Uh, I, I, a milk carton. I've actually seen a company do this where they had sensors in a milk carton that will tell you when, when you're nearly out of milk and, and it will notify you that, hey, there's a store on your way back in there. So it's saving time. In this world, is this, this Internet world in here, we've saved so much time now with 
think of the, the, the Bing and the Googling and finding answers that before you got to go to the library for or call somebody who you think may know it. We're just going to the next level now and making things much more convenient for, for us. Hey, an alarm clock that starts the coffee maker. Awesome. Can I have that? Um, and then think of, of what we could do for health-wise. If you had monitors on you that can warn when, when some medical condition is happening and, and warn you to go to an emergency room or notify your doctor or just track all the things that are going on with you. So you don't have it where, hey, you go to a doctor and this problem you're having is not, you're not having at the time and he has no way of collecting information to find out what's going on. It opens up a whole other world in there. We're seeing a lot of medical companies, drug companies, doctors, hospitals look into how we can use this Internet of Things devices on people to help prevent problems and to give better medical care in there. And Gardner says 10 billion devices are going to be connected, or connected today, and 26 billion by 2020, which is all great, but we need to capture all this information. That's where the modern data warehouse comes into play. So we talked about the traditional data warehouse early on, and now we, we get to the modern data warehouse where those problems we, we talked about of data volumes, real-time performance, uh, structured and, and unstructured data, cloud more data, uh, um, Internet of Things data. We want to have a solution that can encapsulate all of this data in there. And that's when you, have, when you start thinking of modern data warehouse, think of it, how we can solve all those problems in there. And this is what it should look like. I want, at the, at the bottom of the slide, to capture all this various data in there. I want to be able to clean it up, master it, use ETL, enrich the data, and then put it into my relational engine or my non-relational solution, my data lake. I want to be able to have data that could be on-prem and in the cloud. I want to have it updated daily or maybe every hour or maybe every few minutes in there. And on top of that, I want to have all my various reporting tools. And, and ideally, I want to use the same reporting tools I'm used to. The really difficult part with any end user is getting them to, to use a new tool in there. So the best thing I can do for them is say, hey, we have all this new data available to you, and you can, you know what, you can use the same reporting tools we've always used. And that data they can be pulling can be sitting in Hadoop. They don't even know or even care where it's coming from. But the solution you provide to them will give them a whole new world of data that they can have and, ge and generate, the, again, better business decisions on them. I like to say this is all it takes to build a, 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 a modern data warehouse. I just grab all the sources, and I put it in my data warehouse, and I generate all these reports. That's the dream. The reality is more like this slide, where I've taken that uh, slide I, I end at my last presentation, and, and I now add in data that's sitting in the cloud, data that's sitting in a, in a data lake in there, that non-relational data in there. Think of the modern data warehouses. You don't need to have one platform that's going to do everything. It should be a solution that has multi-platforms. What we're seeing a lot of is I have one platform that's relational which is in the blue, and then the bottom left is I have that non-relational platform, that data lake in there. What you need, though, is a solution to integrate all this data together very easily in there. And so this looks very complex, and building it can be, but going forward, the ability to incorporate multiple types of data, the ability to generate reports quickly to end users, the upfront investment you're going to make is going to pay off a thousand times fold and what results you're going to generate to the end users but you need to take the time up front to understand what a modern data warehouse is, to see what kind of data you need to consume, and then come out with the best architecture solution for that. But to get there, you need to understand all these topics I'm presenting in there, and, and hopefully this is starting to, to make you understand better what this environment should look like in there. And, and, and the difficulty then is then Comboard data and how we incorporate that in there. And, and I wish there was just one magic wand I had that could show you how easily this can be done, but it, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to build out this solution here, but the benefits will be enormous. And it's just convincing a lot of times your management that, hey, the time we're going to invest in this is going to pay off so much down the future. Um, and so that's where you need to get them involved by showing them the end result of what you, what you can do with all this data. And the federal query is, is a great topic that a lot of people don't quite get or understand yet. And it's, it has a lot of different names. Um, data virtualization, logical data warehouse, and such in there. But what you're trying to do is have a model where I can use a single query to retrieve data, no matter whether it's sitting in that relational engine or that unstructured Hadoop data lake in there. But 
if I can use, say, regular SQL to pull that data out of those products or that maybe that Hadoop cluster, I don't have to write the ETL to move it into data or else. Um, so I, again, I, I won't go over the vendor solutions, but there are a, a few out there that will allow you to to have the end user use regular SQL to pull the data out of Hadoop. And so the traditional approach is if somebody comes and says, hey, James, I want this data in Hadoop. Well, okay, I've got to write ETL to, to move it into my data warehouse, and then they're going to run a report off of it, and then I'm going to probably delete it. A lot of time-consuming effort that goes into that. With, with these federated query is you can use the data where it sits, and they can write SQL that's going to pass through my data warehouse right into that Hadoop and pass back to them the results without you having to write ETL. And think of the advantage you can get is you can just dump all the stuff in Data Lake and then just tell them, go and mine it. You have your tool, your SQL tool that you can use. You tell me what you want and need. And then once you do that, I, then I'll write ETL to put into Data Warehouse. But you take the time to process all that data and figure out what's valuable. Leave me out of it. And then I'll, I'll get involved once you, once you figure out the part that you actually really need in there. So it's, it's a tremendous benefit. And we're also seeing technologies that not only allow you to query data as it sits, but they actually push down the processing. So if, if I get a query and I want to pull data sitting in my data warehouse and I want to join data sitting in, in this Hadoop cluster outside of it, the technology should be such that if it goes, you know what, I'm going to push that query down into the Hadoop cluster and I'm going to push down a query into that relational engine and then I'm just going to wait for the results to come back and then mash them up and send it back to the end users. And so I'm not only keeping data, be able to keep data where it sits and distribute the data, I'm not able to distribute the processing. So look at federated query approaches when you're looking at building out your modern data warehouse. So this is what it should look like. I should do a select statement. That query model should be able to pull all this data from all these various sources, no matter where they're from, and ingest it back and send the results set back to the end user and hide all that complexity from them. So they don't need to know, well, I need to use SQL to go against my relational engine. I need to use uh, um, <clears throat> a, a Java-type solution um, on my Hadoop cluster and use Hive and MapReduce, that's just uh, there's such difficulty to, to get end users to do that. Instead, we want to have one solution where they can continue using their regular SQL server or whatever um, SQL syntax they want on top of any data that we want to give them. DW in the cloud. Um, this is a, a very hotly contested um, and debated topic of what data can I put in the cloud and what data uh, can I push to the cloud in there? What, what we're seeing, unfortunately, I, I love to say everybody's using the cloud like crazy, but because I deal with a lot of financial companies, healthcare companies, they have these statutes and laws and, and uh, rules within their own company that disallow a lot of sensitive information from being in the cloud. So it's always a, it's a battle, and a lot of times it's just education. It's just saying how secure the cloud can be to get them to better understand it and see that, okay, yeah, this, 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 data, this data can be in the cloud in there. So if that becomes the case, or if they just decide, hey, there's data we can definitely put in the cloud that's not sensitive in nature, how can we incorporate this into both, into our data warehouse that may be sitting on-prem and, and our data that's sensitive on-prem with data that's not sensitive in the cloud in there? So this becomes a, a big issue. And this is a whole other presentation, but you start to think about the transfer cost of, I have a lot of data in both locations, and they're moving the data back and forth. And how do I heal, handle this data that could be sensitive? Can I push it out to the cloud to generate reports, or can I just push out the results into the cloud and generate reports in there? And that's where we, a whole bunch of hybrid solutions come into play. And you really got to sit down and think this through and whiteboard it out and come up with, with your best architecture going forward in there. And this is what I do in my day job. I spend a lot of time with customers and clients to then whiteboard them and figure out how the various solutions in the Microsoft world will fit in there, but also educate them on what all this means, how this all works together in there. And that becomes very, very important to, to, again, open your world up to all these ideas and possibilities that you may not have thought before. And this was interesting. The CWI had this um, report that just came out that shows how many people are using the cloud. And 40% of people don't use the cloud now but are thinking about it. So there's a tremendous opportunity for architects out there to figure out the best way, the best solution to put all this data together in there. So it's, so it's real important that you take the time to, to understand the technologies and Hadoop, and they got Hadoop on-prem, they got Hadoop in the cloud. They, they, every, every company has various um, rules and regulations. You need to find your way around them or, or convince people otherwise that, that, the, that it's okay to put data in there. 
So it's a big, a big challenge in there, but it's, it's so important because cloud is going to become the future of, of most uh, solutions out there. And then finally, SMP versus MPP, and I saw some questions about this. MPP, SMP is what you're traditionally used to, your symmetric multiprocessing in there, where it's a shared, every, shared everything architecture, meaning I have one SQL server, I submit a query, that query submit is competing with other queries for disk and memory and network contention in there and, and CPUs in there. The problem with that is it's a, it's a forklift approach if you start to running out of resources. Is my data warehouse becomes too slow, I need to, okay, buy another hardware, upgrade all, all the parts, back up and restore my data warehouse on there, move the security over, point all the DNS entries to this new box in there. Another DBA for many years, that was very problematic. It was, it was tons of problems that you run into that you don't think about until people start running reports and they, they get those calls of, of of things bombing out in there. And the other issue I always had is I was competing with other applications on the SAN and I'd get calls, oh, you're, you're, my, my report's running so slow, James, what's going on? I look at the box and my CPU is at 20, 30%. It's, it's not, that's the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the I.O. It's not getting it fast enough from the SAN in there. So a lot of what I, what, what I do also as part of my, my daily work at Microsoft is talk about our products that solve this, but they're MPP solutions in there. They're, they're the, the Analytics platform system, the Teradata and Teza, all those are MPP, massive parallel processing, meaning they are shared nothing. Each query gets its own CPU and memory and disk, so they're not competing with other queries in there. The, the big benefit of that is you don't have to learn the kill command because you get that in SMP world. Somebody has a malformed query, it's blocking everybody else. In the MPP world, that query can go and run for hours. It's not going to affect all the other people running queries in there because they all get their own piece of that salute of that hardware in there. And then even best is scale out. So if, if my needs uh, outgrow my current capabilities, whether I need more space, hard drive space, or whether I need faster processing, I can slide in more racks and add more CPUs and space to it. And most solutions are pretty linear in that if I get my queries down with MPP solution to three hours to three minutes, which is very realistic, but I want it to go quicker than three minutes, if I double my hardware, I'm going to double the processing query speed in there. So it's going to go down to that one and a half minutes in there. So it's a great solution if you're at a point where you're on this particular path on this spider chart and you're starting to get more queries that are sophisticated, you're, more data, more data, um, more co complicated queries with, as far as joins and things like that, uh, or mixed workload where I need to be able to load data at the same time I'm running queries, that you're limiting yourself in that blue area to your SMP solution. With an MPP solution, you open up a whole other world of what you can consume. And most big data solutions are going to need an MPP solution there. So that's the first thing you should do is educate yourself on what those products are out there and how they work. And in essence, lay a proper foundation, a hardware foundation, that's going to prevent any roadblocks down the road. Because the last thing you want to do is, okay, we purchased new hardware, and maybe I'm getting a 34%, 40% increase in performance, but in a couple of months or maybe a year down the road, those queries are going to go a lot slower because I'm incorporating a lot more data in there. And now I've got to do that forklift approach. With MPP solution, I can not have to worry about that because all I can do is slide in another rack and I'm going to get the performance I need. And you will generally see queries run 30 to 50 times faster with an MPP solution in there. Now when you're talking about big data and pulling in queries against terabytes of data, billions of rows in there, the, the SMP many, solution many times falls flat and you really need to look to an MPP solution in there. Um, and so to sum up with the when you need an MPP solution is when you need faster performance. At, at least three times is, is when you're getting at it because maybe I can get three times if I upgrade my hardware and go to the new version of SQL Server Oracle, but it's not going to be anywhere near the performance boost I'm going to get jumping from MPP solution. Uh, as well as you're, you're fighting that constant battle of, of, this, of SAN, of, of running out of room on there and the cost of upgrading that. MPP solutions have their own dedicated storage in there and, and the ability to slide and rack so you don't have to worry about, oh, we're running out of space in there and, and we've got to limit what data we can capture in there. And as well as that mixed workload support is a big part of it because as you incorporate more data and you want more real-time 
salute, um, data inside your data warehouse appliance. With SMP, what do you got to do? You got to kick everybody off when you're loading the data. Well, if you're going to do it real time, you, you, you can't do that. MPP solutions, most of them are a mixed workload where you can be loading while you're querying, and those loads won't have any effect on the queries in there. So that's something to think about. And in the end, if, if you look at MPP and say, well, that that's costs a lot of money, if you start looking at the money you're going you're you're to use in buying the latest and greatest in hardware, and you've got to buy two of them because you want it clustered, and you're going to want to get SSDs and Fusion IL cards and, and, and such like that, that cost can be as much as not more than what you can get out of a lot of MPP solutions. So just keep that in mind. So with that, I have a lot of resources that you can use on my, on my uh, that I'll, I'll post. Um, this will be posted, I think, tomorrow, but it's also on my, on my site called jamesserra.com where I dig more into the details, and I'll have this posted on there. And you can, you can uh, feel free to um, ping me with any questions you have after this presentation. And I'll take some questions now, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have on, on the topics I discussed here, because there's a lot I know. But hopefully it gave you a good overview of what big data is and how this can possibly be used to solve your problems you're having now, as well as give more insights and, and more business value uh, in the future going forward. So with that, I'll open it up. Okay, here's the first question. Um, if we build SSAS cubes on MPP and build reports on those, is that really using the MPP capabilities? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so a uh, great question. The, what we find with a lot of clients is they actually get rid of cubes. Because why do we have cubes? Is to aggregate the data because we can't run queries fast enough on the lowest grain of data. With MPP solution, those queries will run so fast on the lowest grain that you don't need cubes anymore. So a lot of companies will throw it out. Now some of them will still use cubes for some other benefits like hierarchies and KPIs and such. But they'll switch to like, well in the Microsoft world it's called Rollup. It's real time access in there. So I don't have to process the cube at all. It'll just pass it through in there. So I don't have to worry about time to take the process it or the cube only have having data as new as the last time it was processed. However, if you still find benefit of creating cubes, is they are going to process the data of the cube so much faster because that query will run on MPP solution. And we typically see cubes process 20 to 30 times faster on an MPP solution than it would on an SMP solution. So that query that cube that process takes two hours may take like 10 minutes to do, so you get a huge benefit from that also. Okay, someone wants to know how Microsoft is posi positioning itself with big data. Oh, it must be a Microsoft person out there. Thank you for asking that. So a follow-up to this one, which I will schedule with Pragmatic Works, is how does Microsoft solve big data? So through that, we will talk about all the various products that Microsoft use to solve all the questions I brought up in here to, to create the data lakes, to use MPP, to do the reporting. Microsoft has so many great products, but it can be difficult figuring out how they all fit together. Somebody brought up, and Microsoft has a lot of great pieces of the puzzle, but knowing how they fit can be difficult. And that's what I will, in my presentation, what I will talk about is how they all fit together. Because it's changing so much. Power BI is another great tool, but it, there's a lot that it incorporates in there. And there's a lot of, of, of understanding that you need to have on how they all work. So when you sit down and whiteboard your architecture, you're going to make sure you use the right tools for each for the for the best purpose that that you're looking for. Okay, and someone wants to know if you have any um, real time use cases. Yeah, so a lot of the ones I actually showed were real time, like the the, the one that does. The, uh, well, actually, the one I, I sort of talked about was the vehicle information. There's actually a company out there doing that now, and I, and I can't give out the name, but they are capturing data in real time and looking to use that to generate alerts to the person driving the car, even such things as there's an accident up ahead, to the potholes up ahead, to the weather's bad, to you need to re, you need some re, some maintenance work done, and we'll schedule it for you. So all that is, is very real time. The medical ones is also another one that we're, we're seeing people dive into. It's a big privacy issue, and there's a lot of challenges with that, but being able to alert someone in real time about a medical problem that you're having. Okay, sorry, a couple more questions came through. Um, where ETL DW solution will perform better in Windows 2012 R2 data center or PW, PDW platform? Oh, somebody knows, somebody brought up Microsoft. So PDW is a parallel data warehouse uh, renamed to Analyst Platform System APS. That's the MPP solution that Microsoft has. That will be, again, the average query goes 30 times faster than that. The data loading is 50 times faster. And that's a whole other presentation which I actually have given on Prime Networks that 
dive more into that, but you're going to see any MPV solution be, be so much faster than MPV solutions. And I really, really go, you can go and look at the numbers, and it's really staggering. As a DBA, I was really shocked at how fast an MPV technology was, was working against queries that would take hours to run down to minutes. Okay. It looks like we're just about out of time, so if we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure to get those to James so he can maybe do a follow-up blog and answer those for you. Um, one of the big questions that people were asking James, and I can't remember off the top of my head, is um, your previous webinar on building an effective data warehouse, you did that with us, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. that's out there. So I, I would say if, if some of this was a little too, too much, um, you can use that to go back and understand a little better what I was talking about. But that, that dives more into, I'm just trying to build a data warehouse. I'm trying to convince my managers why I should build one, how I should build one, Kimball versus Inman methodology, all that is covered in there. So definitely go back and look at that if you need more data warehouse questions. Yeah, and to find it, if you go under the past webinar section, under the free training section on the Pragmatic Works website, um, use the search tool and just search James Sarah. Um, it should pull up all his webinars. Uh, but I will also update the follow-up email that we send out tomorrow to try and include uh, a direct link to that as well. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Again, feel free to reach out to me for any questions you may have. And look for my How to Microsoft Solve, uh, solve Big Data presentation probably in the, in the next month or so. All right. Thanks, everyone.